Sonisha, Tom or Jerry? Jerry. <sighs> Tom all the way. <laughs> Just trying to do his fucking job, man. Back in the dark ages of television, better known as the 70s and 80s, whenever the BBC needed to fill for time, they would invariably do so with cartoons, and more specifically, with Tom and Jerry. First of all, we need to establish why the BBC would need to fill time. Yes, because there might be some people out there thinking, well, wouldn't they just show advertisements or commercials, I guess, for Americans, yeah. like every other channel does, and that wasn't really an option for the BBC, and it still isn't, because uh, the BBC, unlike every other channel on television, does not show ads because it is like funded by the public and it's seen as a public service and you can't just use a public service to shill shitty products and as a result the BBC found that between shows there would be like a small but like you know not insignificant amount of just like just dead air that they needed to fill because even though they were a public service they still had to worry about audience retention rates to justify their existence and when you've just got two or three minutes of dead air audiences will switch that shit over immediately even if the alternative is watching ads because at least they're watching something i think now they just use like trailers for other bbc shows instead. yes or sometimes they do like mini um, news updates things yeah. like that or they have those really stylistic just like bbc title cards and people probably wonder what the fuck are you talking about? Because I'm not sure if that's an American thing, but yeah, the BBC has these like really elaborate sometimes just title cards yeah. to show that you're still watching the BBC. And the famous one is just hippo swimming in a circle, which has nothing to do with the channel, but they, they have it. The thing that I like about um, the BBC is because they're funded by public money, they have to. Um, you put regional programming on. I think ITV has to as well because yeah. they are partially funded by um, the license fee, so they have to have some regional news programming. So they have Look North. And I fucking love Look North because you have to have someone on there with a northern accent. <laughs> so it's the only time you'll watch like, TV in the big hour northern accent. And you're like, yeah, that's right. Damn fucking straight. Represent. Let's go. The thing is, though, do you know the northern accent helped protect Britain from the Nazis in World War II? No, I did not know this. Well, because uh, they found out that um, German and Nazi spies could perfectly emulate received pronunciation, which is, for people who don't know, it's like how posh people speak in the UK, but they couldn't emulate regional accents because regional accents <laughs> have a lot of distinct qualities about them, which make them very difficult to mimic accurately yeah. because there were just like little idiosyncrasies in them that a native speaker of English would recognise, even if they're not from that geographical location. So during World War II, the BBC brought on a guy, I think it's, I think it's something Pickles, I think his name was, and he's from the north and had a really broad northern accent, more broad than mine, and loads of posh people ended up complaining, going, oh, you're sullying the good name of the BBC with this tripe, this trash on our network. And he saved them from being infiltrated by Nazis. Fuck yeah, you're welcome, everyone not from Yorkshire. The thing I love about British accents, though, is that they change, like, every 15 miles. But that reminds me of a study they do every couple of years in the UK, which is, which accent sounds like, you know, the most attractive or most intelligent? And I think the harshest thing that was ever uncovered by that study is that the brummy accent sounds less intelligent than not talking. And it's like, <laughs> oh, that's so bad. Have you heard that? Well, they just it's like, okay, what accent sounds the most unintelligible or makes you sound like the stupidest? And they said that saying nothing is actually preferable to listening to a brummy accent. It's like, oh, that's so rough. That's so mean. So getting back on track, talking about the BBC. Yes. When did they bring in cartoons to fill the dead air? Uh, they've been doing that for a while, but it became like standard practice around the 70s or 80s when it occurred to them that cartoons, like by their nature, tend to be a couple of minutes long, which was perfect for filling you know, like that two, three minutes of dead air. Because a lot of like the early Hanna-Barbera or Merry Melody stuff were just a few minutes long, which means you could fill up three to five minutes of dead air with an entire self-contained episode of one of them those type of shows. And while they generally did have access to a wide variety of content just by you know, the nature of being a public service, so are you familiar with that at all? Well, because the BBC is obviously a public service, they are like, exempt from a lot of like um, copyright shenanigans. Oh, okay. And there's this great breakdown by, I think it's Charlie Brooker for Newswipe that he used to do, yeah. where he's just talking about it. And he's like, yeah, because we work for the Beeb, we generally can use whatever we want because they paid some massive licensing fee to every company on earth to let us just use their shit without having to worry about it and he says stuff like because of that i can play like you know a segment of a beatles song however we do have to pay personality rights if i show you this picture of any shows a random dude we have to pay 50 pounds 
and every time I show it, I have to pay fifty pounds. So I should probably not show it, like you know, multiple times, and continues to just keep showing it <laughs> to waste the money of the production company. If I'm pissing the money away, I might as well push the boat out even further with another great picture of John Selwyn Gummer. So because of this, they had a, like, a large library of content to choose from? Yes. So why pick Tom and Jerry? Because when they looked at the numbers, they realised that whenever they showed Tom and Jerry shorts during those, like, you know, those brief interludes, audience retention rates were higher than they were when they showed anything fucking else, including stuff like Merry Melodies and Hanna-Barbera. Yeah. Which, you know, obviously the British public just like Tom and Jerry more than Bugs Bunny. <laughs> and, we have, and they had actual hard numbers to prove that. And that makes sense because Tom and Jerry is awesome. But the BBC came to rely on Tom and Jerry so much that it became the go-to thing to fill time whenever, say, like, an episode of the news ran long and they needed to like, you know, figure out what the fuck they were doing. They just put Tom and Jerry on. So they'd just be randomly, you'd be watching TV, oh, the news report went on like, you know, a minute longer than it should have done. So we need a minute to like, you know, reshuffle the schedule. Fuck it, put Tom and Jerry on. And that's just awesome to me. So Tom and Jerry are just on call for the BBC whenever they need someone to fill time. So I like to imagine they're just sat there, just waiting. They're just like waiting, like, do you need us yet? No, it's good. But there's like permanently just there, ready, whenever like entertainment is required. And I'm just really in love with the idea that the BBC came to rely so heavily on Tom and fucking Jerry. See, when I was younger, I used to have this box set, Tom and Jerry on like VHS. I think I have the exact same box set, yes, because I adore Tom and Jerry. I forgot how violent it was. Thinking back now, I've not seen it for a long time, but I remember like it being so violent especially for kids watching yeah. as well. Yeah, well that's what um, Itchy and Scratchy was taking the piss out of, wasn't it? That's yes. why Itchy and Scratchy is so over the top violent, because it's supposed to be like a commentary on, like it's so ridiculously over the top, the poor, like the things that happen to this poor cat, and you find it hilarious, obviously just taken to its logical extreme, but yeah. like, yeah, just the scream of Tom as well, was like blood curdling. Do you know when he got his, like, what was it, a mallet hits him on the tail, and it's the, the, ah, it's, it's awful, it's terrifying, that poor cat. And there were just so many dark moments in that show that flew over loads of people's heads when they were younger. Like the famous one is that there's the episode where Tom just fucking dies. Well, the thing is, it's like while Tom's waiting to get into heaven, obviously there's a queue of other cats that's died. And while the guy's like ticking people off, you just see a bag of kittens that's wet come up. Oh, no. It's like, no. And like, I think like the angel cat who's looking, he goes, What some people won't do. And that's just a bag of kittens that got drowned, and that's in a fucking comedy show for kids. And it completely went over my head. And I think in the same episode, because the plot is, like, Tom has to make up with Jerry and get Jerry to sign the uh, letter saying, I forgive you for all you've done. Um, he gets sent to cat hell, which is just him being continually bathed in just this big cauldron of lava while he's being stabbed with a pitchfork. And again, it's a comedy show for kids. <laughs> I saw um, a clip of Tom and Jerry being used as a meme the other day. Okay. Where Tom's going through like the bathroom cupboards and just downing all these pills. <laughs> and I was like thinking, if kids watched that, would kids, you know, think, oh yeah, that's an okay thing to do? You know yeah. what I mean? Like. Well, you have the Simpsons moment again, where they have an episode exactly about that. And it's the one where Maggie hits Homer over the head with a mallet <laughs> because she sees it in Itchy and Scratchy. Yeah. It's like, yeah, there is like, you know, a level of like, you know, parental responsibility that comes into this. But at the same time, you don't expect a show for kids to show like someone like swinging a fucking mallet at someone's head. <gasps> and they have that. And um, I think there are episodes which they have either edited or when you get the um, modern releases on like whatever format you can access them. They have like little warnings telling you, look, it was a different time when we made this shit. We're really sorry. Like the famous one is the episode where Tom smokes. Yeah. We have Cowboy Tom. Oh, God. Yeah. And he, like, he rolls a cigarette and smokes a cigarette. And it's like, you can't really show a cartoon cat people, like, you know, like, just fucking smoking on kids' TV. <laughs> and then you have, like, the lady who owns Tom. Yeah. Which is, like, a really offensive stereotype. But obviously, as a kid, you don't know. But then you look back and you go, oh, that kind of is. That's really bad. Which is a shame, I really like that character. Yeah, you know. And I feel bad now, as well, like, because I, didn't, I wasn't to know. Yeah. I wasn't to know like, why that character like, is so fucking offensive. But then you just have some of those top tier comedy moments that I think are just like untouchable in terms of how perfect they are. 
like the one of just Tom opening the door and you just have the giant mouse. <laughs> Do you remember that one? Where like the elephant, like Jerry makes the elephant out like a mouse yeah, and Tom yeah. opens the door and it's like Jerry shuts it, opens it back up and it's a fucking elephant. <laughs>